I'm going to get started, then Roger's going to come up here. We're, we're, I'm going to do about an hour, and then Roger's going to come up here. We're going to do a Q&A together. So without, without any further ado, General Norman Schwarzkopf had a unique way of walking through a minefield. He said, uh, walk toward the explosions, because that's where the fellows have already found the mines. <laughs> you are super. We've made a ton of mistakes. I got in the car business in 1986. There's not a mistake <coughs> that you can make that I haven't made it over and over and over and over again. So we, if you've ever heard the expression, experience is the greatest teacher, that's the biggest lie that's ever been told. Other people's experience is the greatest teacher. And I think that's what Schwarzkopf was saying. What we're going to talk about today is the opportunities before you. I want to talk about a very small part about how I got in the car business and how I got from uh, an 18 year old kid in 1986 to stand here talk to you fellows and ladies today. I married my high school sweetheart in 1986 and I was going to go work at the tire plant just like my dad had worked at the tire plant and his dad before him had worked at the tire plant and then something terrible happened in, in Miami, Oklahoma. In 1986, B.F. Goodrich closed down. Mm -hmm. So my dad was 41 years old and picked up my little two little sisters and his wife and moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. So in October of 86, after I got married, I moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama too. And anytime I say Tuscaloosa, Alabama, you say... Well there you go. Yeah. Okay. So I moved to Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We were there, and and you just couldn't go get a job at BF Goodrich because it was a United Rubber U a Workers Union plant, and you couldn't just go get a job. So I took a job at a place called Jack Marshall Foods, and Jack Marshall was Elvis Presley's piano player, yeah. and he owned every Kentucky Fried Chicken from Tuscaloosa, Alabama to Pensacola Beach, Florida. <clears throat> and my first job in Tuscaloosa, Alabama was the assistant manager of the Kentucky Fried Chicken on Skyland Boulevard, four blocks away from the University of Alabama. And I say, Go Tigers. What? They're not, they're not smart, Grant. You said that, that <laughs> so anyway, <clears throat> anyway, so at, uh, I, I lived there about six weeks. And I came home and my beautiful bride was there and we, we lived in this really, really nice trailer house. And I got home and she said, Jimmy, I love you, but I'm going home. You can come too, but I'm leaving tomorrow. So I, we packed up everything that we owned and we put it in the car and it was, I mean, it was a nice car. It was a Renault Le Car. Has anybody ever seen one of those before? It was, it was everything that we owned, we moved back from Tuscaloosa, Alabama in a Renault Le Car. And I sold windows and siding for about six months. And I learned a lot selling windows and sidings. And then I walked into a place called Roper Pontiac. Pontiac, for those of you that's never heard of that before, used to be a car brand. Right? They made some really cool Grand Am. And, and, I, I, and you know what? I was a good, <coughs> excuse me, average salesperson. And that means that I sold four, five, or six cars a month. I lived like I sold 12 or 13 cars a month. And by 1989, I was completely broke completely in deck uh, or in debt and I walked into a place on Bayberry Square, Square in Joplin where the real sales salespeople work. Really good sales like people. Leo, right? No, it was an army, recru <laughs> army recruiter's office. And they hadn't fought a war in 25 years, so I figure, hey, I'm safe. I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna get the GI Bill, right? And I'm, I'm gonna go to the army for four years, and I'll come back, and I'll go to college, and somebody else is gonna pay for it. They, I went to two wars in four years. I went to Panama during the Panamanian invasion. I went to Operation Desert Storm, which was the, the little bitty tiny baby war to what these boys have went through in the last 10 or 12 years. Doesn't compare. Where I went and where they went does not compare. <clears throat> but I came down on a levy to go to Korea in 1992, and I said, I'm not, I've, already, I've already seen enough of the world that I want to see. And then I got back out, and I was in nursing school at Pittsburgh State. When I was sitting on a bench at the mall, and a guy named Hal Roper walked up to me and said, why don't you come back and sell cars? And I go, I'm never selling another thing as long as I live. Why not? Because it's a scam. What do you mean it's a scam? Nobody can make money. You get to make money. You get to live in the big house. But I'm going to work bell to bell. I'm going to go to work at 8 o'clock. I'm going to come home at 9 or 9.30. And when I, guys, this is the difference between 1986 and 2016, right? You're like, God, that's a long time. <laughs> that's 30 years. If you sold a car, you got paid. If you didn't sell a car, you what? Didn't, didn't get paid. And if I had two babies, I had a four-year-old and a two-year-old, and I would get uh, 
to work. I didn't sell a car all week and everybody get a paycheck but me. And when you left the store on Saturday without selling a car, you left with a lump in your throat, tears running down your face. I'm going to have to go tell my wife I don't have money for formulas. That was a stressful deal. So when I got back, Hal Rupert says, why don't you come back and sell cars? I said, I'm not ever selling anything as long as I live again. Why don't you come back and work part time? I go, how's that work? Well, you just work four to close, four to eight, Monday through Friday and work on Saturdays. Heck, I'll even give you a demo to drive. Well, I was at this time, I'd upgraded my transportation from that Renault Alliance to an AMC Concorde all-wheel drive. And if you have it, and well, the heater clutch was out of it on the front, so if you had to get out of town, you had to hurry and get out of town before the car overheated, then it was on the highway when it's 60 mile an hour, it wouldn't overheat, but when you got into town, you better get parked somewhere because it's gonna, it overheated twice a day. Out, on the way out of town and on the way back into town every day. And I'm, this idea of a demo was a good deal. Well, in 1991, this was 1992. In 1991, a guy named Joe Verde met, uh, made a set of tapes called How to Sell Cars in Today's Market by Joe Verde. And I knew if I'm going to get back in the car business, i got to do something different. Because what, what I did the first time only made me completely in debt and totally broke, and I had to join the Army, and I, that's not an option anymore, so I'm going to figure something out. What I realized was that Joe and I had a real similar background. He was an old military guy, I was an old military guy. We, we A lot of our story kind of lined up, so it, it was e easy for me to get evenly yoked with this guy. He said silly things like, uh, if you want to sell more cars, you need to talk to more people. I knew that. If you want to sell more cars, you need to let everyone know, uh, you know who you know, where you work, and what you do. If 99% of the people got to drive a car before they buy it, it's probably a good idea to get as many people to drive cars as they can. All kinds of ridiculous things like that. And I mean simple, ridiculous, sending out a monthly newsletter to every single customer. And he said all this stuff, and this is what I figured out. I learned something about selling cars in the Army that nobody ever told me I was learning about business. And the number one thing I learned in the Army was if you do exactly what you're supposed to do, when you're supposed to do it. If you show up, and I swear, how many veterans do we have here? Now, call me a liar. If you show up to formation, how many veterans, where are the veterans at? Okay, if you show up in formation with shiny boots, a pressed uniform, no, nothing well, hanging on it, time, a good haircut, and you show up on time, at attention, <clears throat> and you just do exactly what they tell you to do when they tell you to do it, you stand out among all the other people in the military. Because all of us uh, that have been in the military know uh, there's some people that just don't do that. There's, most of them just don't do that. <laughs> so I just decided I'm gonna do what Joe Verde said to do. My best month in the car business from 1986 to 1989 was 11 cars, that was my best month. My average month was four or five cars a month, but if anybody asked me how many cars I sold, why'd I tell them? Eleven, because I did that one time. So how many cars a month did you sell? Eleven. I've never averaged eleven cars the whole time I was in the car business, but that's what I told people, right? Because I was good at lying to myself. So I, at my average was three or four, four or five cars a month from 1986 to 1989. Well, now I, I don't have any time. I got from four to eight, Monday through Friday, and all day on Saturday. And if Joe Verde told me to do it, that's what I did. My first month back in the car business, working part-time, was 13 cars. My first full year back in the car business was 23 and a half cars. At the end of that year, I changed my major from nursing to business. My next year was 23 and a half cars. I'd made 60 some thousand, this is 1994, and then I just dropped out of college. Because I started doing the math, I'm going to I go. I, I'm not going to make a, a nurse can't make what I'm making. I didn't know what I was going to do. I dropped out of college and took a management job with that company, and then I came over here. I paid for my education. We never had anything like this. The whole time that I was in the car business, we never had anything like this. I went and seen Joe Verde three times a year. Wow, it's six or seven hundred bucks, and I paid for it. I even paid one time to have a, a lunch with him. 
and we got to sit at the same table, and I'm going, oh, this is going to be so, so cool to sit at this table with Joe Verde. I can tell you, he's been saying the same material way too long because he can't have an intelligent conversation. He just, it's like that little script. Yeah, everything you hear in a Joe Verde video is what you hear at lunch. I said, I, I wish I would have paid for this. But we were sitting in a group just like this at one of the first tra training seminars, and there was a lot of new salespeople, and he went around the room and said, how many cars do you sell? Eight, six, eight, nine, 11, 14, six, four, five, three. He got to me, and I just bowed up, stuck my chest out, and I said, 23 and a half. He goes, man, how long have you been stuck in that rut? And I went, uh, about a year and a half now, because I found that ceiling. You know what? One of the reasons that you are going to succeed where others have failed before you is because you're going to get a crystal clear understanding of opportunity. Get your calculator out. You see a little box like this on your first page? Everybody get a calculator out on your first page. Did you put that in the front of the book? Well. Yeah, I did. Okay, it says the clear understanding of opportunity. Find a page that says a clear understanding of opportunity. Anybody find a page that says that? It's actually page one. In your book. In your book. If you got a book, it's right behind the outline. Guys, I'm going to tell you what. You're going to go through a big part of my workbook, and I'm one of those cheater teachers that just give you the outline up front. So if you miss something... The outline is in there. Everybody got that? So my question to you is, what's that number? Raise your hand if you're here for the money. Raise your hand high if you're here for the money. You're not? All right. And the money. <laughs> I'm here for the money. That's what I showed up for. I love selling cars. I wouldn't do it for free. I find all kinds of stuff. I own a Nash, I own a state park. I'd be in my state park right now. You own a state park? I do. What's state park? It's called the Lodge at Jim Adams State Park. You can find it on Facebook. That's what I call my front yard. But that's and people can people and, and on on Facebook it's a state park. Is it not? It is. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> so if I if I was gonna work for free, I'd be working down there in the state park. But everybody came here for the money, the opportunity to make a living, the opportunity to get a career. So I'm going to I'm gonna back up and I'm going to ask you this number. And this is not an auction. And what I mean by this is not an auction, you haven't done anything yet. So we don't need to try to impress one another. But if I said, what is that number? What is the number that if you earned in the next 12 months, you could call your, you could feel like you've risen above the status quo and start calling yourself a professional? If that's number, if that number is 15 grand, that's the number I want. If it's 30 grand, that's the number I want. But here's what I don't want to happen. 30, 35, 40, 45, 50, 55, 60, 60. And this, by the time we get over here, this guy's going, I need to make $228,000 to call myself a successful professional, right? So what I need to know, and I want you to do me a favor, in this box right here where it says annual income yearly, everybody see that box? I want you to write that number. If it's 30 grand, write 30 grand. If it's 50 grand, write 50 grand. If it's 60 grand, write 60 grand. What do you want to earn in the next 12 months? Write it down. Make sure you got your calculator out. Stephen, I'm going to use you and your calculator. Are you leaving for good? Yeah. I'm, so I don't have to use my calculator. I'm just going to use you for math. Okay. Everybody have a number. If you earned that, if we walked back in this conference room, you and I, and I said, Rhonda, what's your number? $30,000. If you came into this conference room a year from now, holding a check stub of $30,022, would you feel like you succeeded? I would be a happy woman. Excellent. I'm glad to hear that. What's your number? Dustin? 70000 70, So let me ask you this. If I came in here Latin and held the check stub up here that was 50, how much, what's the most you've ever earned in your life? 79. Okay, so if I held up a check stub that said $70,022, you'd be happy. Absolutely. That's the number. And guys, guess what? Rhonda's goal has no relationship to Dustin's goal. None whatsoever. And I'm going to warn you, I, I love friendly competition, but my goals are my goals. I want to compete and win, but my goals are my goals. If, if they call me on Saturday afternoon and say, man, 
Clint down there at the Ford store sold 43 cars today, and you guys only have 22. I'm going to go, well, our goal was 18. I'm thrilled to death. I hope he sells 700 cars this weekend. But it has nothing to do with my goals. That's why I don't want you, that's why I don't want you to get so spun up in what somebody else is doing at this point. What's your number? 60 grand. 60 grand. What's your number? 30. 60. 60. 80. 80. 50, 75, 70, 60, 60, 70, 60, 40, 60, 60. 40, 60. 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, 60. 40, you gonna think of yourself as a professional? Yeah. Okay. How many of you've been blackberry picking? Anybody been blackberry picking? It's hot. Megan, have you been blackberry picking? Yeah. Okay. It's usually July, and you usually got a white five-gallon bucket, and there's stickers, and there's chiggers, and it's hot, and you're sweaty, and you pick, 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 and you. It seems like you've been picking half your lifetime, and you look into the bucket, and you do this, and you can still see the white on the bottom of the bucket, right? And then your mom says, "Hey, I got a better idea. Why don't you take this Dixie cup?" And you take this, and you all leave the five-gallon bucket up here. You just fill that cup up, and when it gets full, you bring it back to me, and I'll dump in the five-gallon. Well, guess what? You're a professional blackberry picker now. You can, get the, you can fill that, but you can get that full, of, and you dump in the five-gallon bucket, and then you turn around and you look at it. Man, this thing's half full because you took a monumental task and turned it into a bite-sized element of itself. What you're getting ready to do is learn how to make whatever number you wrote on your paper. And here's my promise. You follow this math on this paper, you will succeed. You don't, you won't. But there'll never be a case where you follow the math on this paper and not succeed. Sales is a numbers game. You better understand that. Because you're going to have the tendency three weeks from now to put your hands in your pockets and stand on the corner of the parking lot and say, man, I sure hope I get a good up today. Then you don't get it. There's no such thing as a good up. Let's talk about averages for a minute. If I, we're going to use uh, 50,000. Raise, where's my 50,000 people? Raise your hand if you wrote 50,000 down. Just one? 40,000. Just one? Two? Uh, 30,000. Two? Uh, 60,000. Oh, whoa! That's the number we're using. That's the number we're using. So you got your calculator? The average commission, do you? Yes. Okay, the average commission on a vehicle sale, excluding or including spiffs and bonuses, is around 300 bucks. Some are much, much bigger, some are, and there's ways to make bigger bonuses. So if I said, I, if I took $60,000 and divided that by 300 bucks, now it tells me that I need to sell 200 cars a month a year. To, a year, a year to make sixty thousand dollars. <throat> so whatever your number is that you wrote down, and you divide that by three hundred, tells me how many cars you need to sell this year to achieve that goal, right? Mm -hmm. Anybody lost in the math? There's no dumb. <coughs> there's no dumb questions. Just dumb answers. Forty thousand divided by three hundred equals what? Right. And help. If somebody next to you is, needs help, what is 40,000 divided by 300, Megan? It's 133.33. And, and, and guess, guess, hey, Megan said it right. Point what? 333. If we're going to set real, clear, specific goals, that point three three matters, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. So, Megan, you, you need to sell one third, one third. I need to sell 133. 133 and yeah, 0.33. And is it Chelsea? Yes. Chelsea or Chelsea? Chelsea. Chelsea, what's, what's your, how many units do you need to sell? 100. 100. How many do you need to sell? 233. How many you need to sell? 233.33. Okay. And you? Everybody got that? The average closing ratio, and I'm going to tell you what a closing ratio is. How many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? One. Three on the commercial, but uh, one, two, three. Uh, that little owl. Uh, 
You know what we're talking about? Yes, do, are, really? Are you old enough? Yes, I Wait. Uh, so the average closing ratio is 20%. And what 20% means is that me, means you have to talk to five guests to sell one car. So if I want to know how many people I need to talk to annually, I take the number of units that I'm going to sell annually and times that number times five as Steve Cottle is going to put in the blank under opportunity. So this would be yeah, 1,000 in our example. Yes. All right. Everybody have that? Yes. You talk to 1,000 people this year, you're going to make $60,000. I got it. I got a dirty secret for you. You talk to a thousand people this year, you're gonna make a heck of a lot more than sixty thousand dollars. That's just saying. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. Clearly understand it. Now, remember that Blackberry picking story we were talking about? Let's take these numbers, take these numbers, and divide them by twelve. Take whatever you have in your annual income unit an opportunity goal and divide them by 12. And again, if you don't get it, ask somebody next to you, okay? Now, how many cars do you need to sell a month, Stephen? Do you know? Yeah, um, how many cars do I need to sell a month? Yeah, did 12. you not do your paper? No, I did 12 12.5. How many cars do you need to sell a month? 16.6. 16.6, how many cars do you need to sell a month? 27.77. 27 Michael? 16.6. 16.6. How many opportunities do you need a month? I need 500. No, a month. Oh, a month? Yeah, look here. We need to be. I'm doing it on here. Okay, okay. Do, do it on that form, like this still right here. I thought that said 833. Anybody need help? This is the most important thing we're going to talk about today. If you need if you need help, let me know. You square, Dustin? Yes, sir. Good. How many opportunities do you need in a month, Michael? 83. 83 opportunities. You're going 60,000 in it. Point three. Hayden, how many opportunities do you need a month? Uh, 8.33. Okay. I'm sorry, 41.6. 41.6. That's the unit. Yeah. You and Rhonda have the same goal. Okay, everybody pay very close attention. The next, when we talk about weekly, I want you to take your annual number. Are you listening to me? Mm -hmm. Your annual number divided by 52. Take your annual number divided by 52. Dog okay. <laughs> so anyway, how many of you have your daily number filled out? The daily number is you take the weekly <coughs> number divided by five. Why only five? No, we're not, no, we're because you didn't rate you didn't get raised in the car business that Roger and I got raised in. Because we worked seven days a week unless you lived in a state that was closed on Sunday, which we did, thanks God for Missouri Blue Laws. But, they, but we worked from 8 o'clock. Guys, we would get to work on Saturday mornings at 6.30. That we, could, we worked under an old up system. So you had a chip, a poker chip that had a hole drilled in it with your name written on it. And the first one in in the morning got to put their chip on the board. The uh, first up of the day. So they get the first cash on. So that you, we'd have salespeople showing up at 6.15 in the morning. Billy Curry spent the night one time. You know what we did? We didn't understand the car business. We didn't understand uh, where opportunity comes from. So let's talk about it this way. You've set a goal, right? You set an annual income goal, a monthly unit goal, and a monthly opportunity goal, and you took your big five gallon bucket of blackberries and you set a monthly goal. And then you set a weekly goal. Let me ask you a question, Cedar. Which is easier, to make $230 or $60,000? It's the same thing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. If you do it every day. Which is easier, to talk to 1,000 people or 3.84 people? Equal. 
Right. So what we've done is we've taken this monumental task and reduced it into a bite-sized element of itself, and I'm going to circle a number, and I want you to do that on your <coughs> paper, too, once you get that figured out. If you want to earn $100,000 or $30,000 or $40,000 or $60,000, what your number is, the only thing you have to do, guys, I'm going to tell you what, if you learn nothing else, if you learn nothing else, Learn this. The only thing that you have to do is put yourself in front of this many people, whatever your she says, today and every day for the rest of your career. And if you change this, this number changes. You follow me? Because I'm going to tell you, if I say, if my monthly opportunity goal is 83 people, and if I sell eight, if I talk to 83 people, I'm gonna make five grand. This is my promise. You talk to 83 people this month, you'll make five grand. You don't talk to 83 people, you won't make five grand. But there's never gonna be an opportunity where you talk to 83 people and not make five grand. My promise is this, Roger will attest to this. If you make, if you talk to 83 people with any kind of demonstration rate at all. You're gonna make way more than five grand. Do you have a question? Yeah. What do you mean by see, talk to people? I'm well. We're you're a great straight man, and we're gonna go into that to, on the next page. Okay. Let, let, I, everybody understands that. You can control that. You know what? You you can't control the weather. You can't control advertising, interest rates, fuel economy, the stock market. I can control this. I can say I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna meet three people today, and I'm gonna make sure at least those three people demonstrate a card. That's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna be in the relentless pursuit of gathering up opportunity because if I talk to three people today, that's what I'm gonna earn. Luther Hodges said, there's no recession or depression or economy, good or bad, that good old fashioned salesmanship can't overcome. That's right. It's from my Bible. <laughs> it does, it gets me wanna, it gets me excited. Leo's not here, so I'm going to tell you the truth. We had a big debate whether we we're going to tell the truth or not. In most dealerships, it's over 90% of the people get into our industry get out in the first year. That's a fact. Why? Look at your paper. Number one, they get little or no training. When they get in the car business, they go, hey, welcome to the car business. The new cars are parked over there. The used cars are back there. The brochure rack's right over there. Go make us proud. And that's all the training they got. Guys, you've got more sales training in a day than most so-called professionals get in their entire career. And you got the benefit of listening to the people like Roger Williams. Tomorrow you're going to listen to a guy named uh, Josh Kirby. The, uh, you're going to listen to a guy named Jason Chambers. These guys have, these guys are the best in town. And you get to, and you know what? We don't send salespeople up to train you. Most dealerships go, hey, this is Bobby. He's a little guy. Hey, Billy, go show him the ropes. <laughs> and bring me back some coffee from Starbucks. You're getting trained by the best teachers in the industry. Definitely the best teachers in job. So, little or no training. The inability to maintain a positive selling attitude. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Poor time management and the lack of understanding of opportunity. I don't know what stores you're going to. I know where he's going. He's going, signified by the red shirts. We brand at Toyota. You're branded as Toyota. We have, guys, you have to maintain a positive selling attitude all the time. Most of the time when people fail is because they couldn't control what goes on between their ears and behind their eyes. We have a rule at Toyota. This is Disney World. This is sanctuary. This is where we come to get away from it all. Because we all have them. Dog problems, cat problems, wife problems, husband's problems, money problems, mother-in-law problems. The Bible says, as sure as sparks fly upward, trouble comes to man. And I believe it. The rain falls on the just and unjust alike. Guys, there, there's problems. Our world is full of problems. But your, your problems aren't going to get any better 
by bringing them to work. Max Lucado wrote, wrote a book about bringing your garbage, like you get in your kitchen and you put banana pills, coffee brine, dirty <laughs> diaper, and you get it all, and you cinch it all up, you go put it in the front seat of your car right next to you, and you drive to work with it, and you pick it back up and you go, hey, good morning, everybody. I want to give you some of this, <laughs> give you a little bit of that, and how about a little bit? Nobody do that, right? Right. Hunt will do it every day. Every single day they do it. You know what pisses me off? I had a trade bid a while ago. I had, I had a trade bid. It's fifteen hundred dollars less than Bobby's. Bobby had one bid. They bid at five thousand dollars more. Blah blah blah. And then all this, guys. Is that not the same thing? Yeah. You're spreading cancer. Man, this used to be a good place to work. We used to get Krispy Kreme donuts. Now they just bring those dudes donuts. I'm gonna eat that crap. <laughs> what are we having for lunch today? We're having Chick Fil A. Great again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Most people fail for an inability to maintain a positive selling attitude. And you better learn to fake it till you make it. Attitude is a choice. It is a choice. Your mood that you're in right now, you make a decision. You make a decision. And if we put that I choose to be test in front of every decision that we made, before we made that decision, we'd make better decisions. We'd walk into the bathroom and look in the mirror and say, you know what, I choose to be pretty pissed off right now. I'm, I'm choosing to not do any work today and I'm just gonna choose to grumble. I know I need money, right? Would, it, would you do that? But you are making a choice. You, you're making a choice and not only are you making a choice to affect your environment, but you're also making a choice to affect everybody else's environment around you when you spread what I call cancer. And the bet, you know what doctors tell you to do with cancer? Cut it out. Shoot it with a laser beam, shoot it with a nuclear gun and cut it out. And I'm, in my store, this is how these guys can tell you because I've only been there two weeks and I'm, I'm a coach. I'm a coach at my store. I sound like a coach, I talk like a coach and it drives me crazy, but I'll say, I'll say, Dustin, you seem like you're in a bad mood today. Yeah, bye, bye. Well, go home. Just go home. Come back tomorrow. Get your mind right. Come back. This is Disney World. No, I'll be all right. And I'm going to say, you've lost your chance to be all right. And if you can't maintain a positive selling attitude, you don't even get to come back tomorrow. So why don't you go home and think about your career? We had a guy that worked for us named Butch Neal. <clears throat> Butch started at the, in the detail shop at Roper Pontiac in 1968. Butch was simple. He was not a real educated guy, but he's a hard working guy. And in 1971, his wife left him with three kids. Wow. And he was, he was a car detailer. He was a car detailer in 1986 when I got there and this story started in 1968. This guy washed his cars his whole adult life. That's what he did for a living. And he's great at it. But he was so ramped up with his kids and all this drama with his wife leaving that he showed up for work 45 minutes late one day and he goes up to the time clock and he punches his time clock and Gilbert Roper, which was Hal Roper's dad, was a saint of a man, that Hal Roper is the patriarch now, but this is back in the 60s. He puts his arm around Butch's shoulders and he says, Butch, you're 45 minutes late. <coughs> and he goes, Gil, my, you know, my wife left, and the kids this, and that, and this, and just, just dumped all his problems on him. And Gil just put his arm back around him and said, man, how much worse would it be if you're unemployed too? <laughs> wow. And for the next 31 years, the guy was never one minute late for work. Because somebody told him the truth, right? You have got to figure out how to maintain a positive selling attitude. <clears throat> and you have to take that I choose to be test every time that it's a letting you affect your income. I had a kid named Travis Kennedy that worked for me, and Travis is now the vice president of OnStar for General Motors. He sold cars for me as a uh, when I ran uh, Subaru and Kia back in the early 2000s. And Travis had a wife and a two-year-old baby, and I knew how to manage him more than anybody because when he would start acting that way or start sloughing off or just not maximizing his day's worth of opportunity, I'd walk up behind him and I said, Gosh, I can imagine the conversation you're going to have dinner tonight. What? 
I bet you go home and say, yep, honey, guess what? I did today. <laughs> Nothing. I didn't pick up. I didn't make a phone call. I didn't go wait on a customer. Matter of fact, I hid out half the day. I know we need diapers. I know that's you're missing the point of my story. I, I know we're out of formula. I know we don't have any money, but listen, it's funny. Right. And he'd go, that ain't funny. I'd say, no, it's not. It's not funny at all. But it got, you know what? Got his attention. As iron sharpens iron, he's the vice president of, of uh, OnStar for General Motors, so he, I guess we wasn't too bad, right? Poor time management. Guys, we're going to give you so much to do. We're going to teach you our new dealer socket CRM. We're going to teach you, we're going to give you Cardone, Cardone on demand training. We're going to teach you how to use a key track machine. Then we're going to teach you how to do this, and you got to be here for this meeting. You got to be, and you're going to go. When am I ever going to have time to sell cars? The one thing I need you to know about selling cars is your function, your job, everything you do is designed around this: putting yourself in front of three to five opportunities every single day. This is the mission. Now we're going to show you a whole bunch of other things that are worthwhile, right? But Andy Andrews says, if your goal is to be a professional boxer, medical school is a distraction. Medical school might be very, very worthwhile, but not if your goal is to be a professional boxer. Your job is to keep the main thing the main thing all day. When we ask you to do product training, you need to specify 20 minutes of your day to do product training. We ask you to do CRM training. We need you to specify 20 minutes of your day to do CRM training. We were, I worked with a girl named Kathy Sleep over at the Honda store. And Kathy had the most beautiful day planner in the car business. And we would give her awards and the sales meeting. Everybody turn in your day planner. And if it was if it her penmanship was good, she wrote out all of her appointments, wrote out all the people that she was gonna call, and it was so beautiful. But she never sold anything. And she never called anybody. And you say, Kathy, what, what are you doing? Well, I don't have time. I don't have time. I've, you know, by the time I get all this stuff logged in my book, <laughs> Zig Ziglar talking. Anybody know who Zig Ziglar is? Zig Ziglar says, he said, my, he, he said, when I lived in Yazoo City, Mississippi, my neighbor was rich. And you know how I knew they were rich? Because they had a cook. You know how I really knew they was rich? Because the cook had something to cook. <laughs> and he said, one day I walked in the kitchen and Mamie, who was the cook, pulled these biscuits out and put them up on the stove and they're about this thick. They look like pancakes. And he said, Mamie, what happened to them biscuits? He said, funny thing about those biscuits, Zig, they squatted to rise, but they got cooked in the squat. That's what I'm talking about. Man, we get ready to get ready to, oh God, I'm ready, and we, but we just don't take that step. So my girlfriend and I are driving to Arkansas the other day for my daughter's birthday, and she's been talking about, I want to open an antique booth, and I want to start, I want to start doing crafty stuff, and blah, 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 blah. And I said, you know what your problem is? And she goes, what? I said, let me tell you about a story in Yazoo City. <laughs> she's got, so that's, you know what she says? He's my general manager. <laughs> Because, and Big Daddy, by the way. <laughs> 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 yeah. 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 I, I, get, I gotta say it. Like, I like it. I like that. I like it. I wish I could say I didn't, but I do. <laughs> so, hey, when you get ready to do something, do it. That's right. Don't talk about it. About Take it. a step. The, the, the reason people fail in this industry is they find something else to do besides what they came here to do. Which is that? Nothing more than you know what? We can end this class right now and say, class to Smith, if you remember that, you, and you go try to you, you won't you won't be as successful as you'll successful as you'll be by spending a week with some pretty talented people. But when you get out of this class, you just need to do it. I can tell you, I lived on First and Front Street in Galena, Kansas. What? Now listen to this. Yeah. I'm from Galena, Kansas. Born and raised, still, still live in Galena, Kansas. Now listen to, listen to this. 
I lived on the poor side of Galena, Kansas. Oh, there it's all poor side. No. Hey, hey, no. Hey, hey, okay. Hey. Hey, hey, time out. In the poorest city, in the poorest county, right. in the in poorest Kansas. state of Kansas, I lived on the bad side of town. <laughs> That's right. And you know what? John Johnson, who wrote who wrote Ebony Magazine and Jet Magazine, who owned these huge high rises in uh, in in Chicago, was born on a dirt floor shack in southern Arkansas. And he used to always say, you know, you can get anywhere in the world you want to get from a dirt floor shack in southern Arkansas. Because from this point forward, it's your it's your job. Nobody's going to help you be successful. Nobody's going to hold your hand and say, now go talk to that guy and say this. Or that. We're going to give you the tools, but then you're going to have to do it. He also said, John Johnson said one more thing. Where there's hope in the future, there's power in the present. That's my favorite John Johnson quote. So, anyway. Little or no training. You're going to get it. The inability to maintain a positive selling attitude and I promise you if you work for me you only get to not do that a couple times we'll find someone that can have a who can work the happiest place on earth poor time management and the lack of real understanding of opportunity guys you can what time is it, Roger it is 148 okay I got about 10 minutes left then we're gonna take a break you can screw the car deal up from stem to stern you can screw up a demo, screw up a walk around, walk around. You can screw it all up. But if they say yes at the end, and they and they pay us and they drive off, you get paid, That's right. right? You win. The problem is, most of the people who are in the car business right now that have been in the car business for two or three or four years don't understand that. And you better understand that if you ever want to be successful in the car business. That math right there, I wrote on my in my workbook every single day, 23 equals 620833. That was my goal. Every day in blue highlighter, I wrote it, and then I kept a track accounting on the bottom of it. Every day, I've had this many opportunities. <coughs> this, this is, that's, I was an opportunity manager. Most people don't have what it takes to have a crystal clear understanding of opportunity period and where what what opportunity means put yourself in front of that many people and you'll be successful give me that back uh, right around the corner here. Here. give me this back Whoa. about four blocks from here there's a baseball stadium 12 14 blocks from here called Bo Joe Becker Stadium the blasters play there right I'm gonna make you this challenge and I brought it back I'm going to set up a pitching machine at Joe Becker Stadium, and it's going to throw pitches 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and here's the opportunity. You go there, Megan, take the bat. I'm going to get it back from you. Okay. You hit six balls over the fence, just six. I'm going to give you $100,000 a year for the rest of your life. All you got to do is hit six balls over the fence. I'll hit those six balls. Right? You in? You in? Anybody not in? You know, believe it or not, given an opportunity, people would say, Jim, I appreciate that, but I just don't know much about baseball. I've just never been a big baseball fan. There's going to be people that say, I do it, but I, you know what? I just had this headache, and this headache won't quit, and I've taken everything for it. I, you know what? I'd love to do it, but right after work, I get the kids, and by the time I get the kids picked up and we get them something to eat, there's really no time for baseball. And I'm going to say, it's 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They go, yeah, I, you know, I appreciate the opportunity. There's people that would go to the baseball stadium, and they would leave mad. They'd say, you didn't say nothing about curveballs. I knew this was a scam all along. You didn't say anything about curveballs. That thing's throwing 110 miles an hour. See, I don't even know why you brought me down here for this ridiculousness. Right? You know those people? Then there's you. You're going to show up with nothing but swinging in mind, right? There's going to be people that got there that took a couple swings and went, this ain't me. And you know what? You're going to stay. I'm going to make sure I don't hear anything. And here's what's going to happen. 
for all you great new baseball players. You're going to swing and miss, and swing again and miss, and swing again and miss, and miss, and miss, and miss, and miss, and go, God. And you're going to step back up there, and you're going to miss again, and miss again, and miss again, and you're going, I suck at this. <laughs> and then you're going to swing and miss again, and you're going to foul one off, and foul another one off, and foul another one off. Now they're firing fastballs at your head, and you're ducking <laughs> swinging anyway. Right? Curveballs lunging across the plate. And then all of a sudden, boom, you hit one. Pops up over the backstop, goes over the fence behind you. The umpire takes his mask off and goes, one. You go, what? Right. Son, it doesn't matter how you get him over the fence. As long as you get him over the fence, let's go. <laughs> hey, guess what? It's a whole new ball game because now you know you can get six balls over the fence. Right. I say that and we're going to take a break. But I say that because of this. That's what you got to know. Every day. Today, tomorrow, the next day, the <coughs> next day. You don't have to be a super thing. Warm myself out, Roger. I run three miles today. I'm still already wore out. I hear your breath, too. I know it. I was trying to hit six balls with you. <laughs> and then, you know what? Did you see me breaking my swing there? Because I was afraid I was going to go. I know. And the the new away. laptop that took so long. <laughs> That'd be hard to explain. Uh, Gary? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, so who wants the bat? Me. Good. Let's take a 10-minute break.